Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, or whenever you're watching this message. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen. My name is Rachel Lemke. I'm the student pastor here at uh, St. John Presbyterian Church. I want to welcome you all to our time of virtual worship. Um, real quick, before we get started, I want to take a moment to personally thank all of you at St. John Presbyterian Church. Um, my colleagues and I found ourselves without a place to do our ordination exams the past few weeks because the library was closed. And you all on the session and Pastor Allen welcomed us in to use the space so that we could focus rather than doing the tests in our apartments. So thank you for that. We were very safe and um, we just, we really appreciate your ministry with the students at the seminary. Um, let us prepare our hearts for worship. God of forgiveness and resurrection, we come to you today on this Sunday in the Easter season, a little confused and concerned and nervous about the state of our world and our country. <clears throat> we we pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to hear your word this morning and that we can take your message out to all the world to know that you are love and you love your children. In your name, amen. Our scripture message today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
When he has brought, when he has brought all, all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from, run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Our second scripture message today comes from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would, send their they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us ears to hear you, minds to know you, hearts to love you, and lives to serve you. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's children said. Now, I don't know much about herding sheep but I do know a lot about walking my cat. We've got our one cat trained to put on a harness so that he can go outside. And he will literally sit by the back door and whine until we come and put this harness on him. And when we do, he'll stand up straight on the glass door so I can Velcro around his neck and his, around his underbelly and then when he's all harnessed in and I open the door, what does he do? He stands there. <laughs> he doesn't want to go out on his own. So then I have to pick him up and plop him down on the patio. And then next what happens is we go about 12 paces for a human. So however that translates to cat paces. And then he lies down in the grass and he sits there and ponders existence while I stand there holding the leash. That's basically what it's like walking a cat. Standing there while he's just lying there living his best life in that spot of grass. I have learned that I need to take a chair with me next time. But there's a lot we can learn about life from that cat. First, our need for security and guidance. And second, to find out what we really need to live our best life now. Our gospel lesson today shows us how in Christ, we have the answer for both. First, this week's lesson teaches us that in Christ we find salvation, security, and sustenance. The three S's, we'll call them. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. What he means is that through him we find salvation. In the sheepfold we find security. And in the pasture we find sustenance. These three things each satisfy the major essences of our being. Salvation for our souls, 
security or peace for our minds and sustenance for our bodies. Often we only come to Jesus focusing on the salvation part, but Christ's influence in our lives is holistic. He provides everything we need for our mind, our bodies, and our spirits. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Indeed, the grace and power of Christ is sufficient to meet all our needs, but it is for us to go through the gate. Unfortunately, we are stubborn. We think we can go it alone. And just like my cat, when I tell him it's time to go back inside, will he walk the 12 paces back to the door? No, of course not. I have to pick him up and carry him back to the safety of home. But that's what Christ does for us sometimes. Though he invites us to come through the gate, sometimes he carries us. Sometimes in our weakness, sometimes maybe when we're kicking and screaming. But through the gate, we have access to everything we really need, mind, body, and spirit. The second lesson we learn today is not to let anything or anyone rob you of joy. Jesus said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now the thieves and bandits that Jesus had in mind were the false shepherds, those who had exploited whom they were supposed to lead dating back to the days of the Hebrew prophets. It was Ezekiel who said, thus says the Lord, ah you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should, you, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak, you have not healed the sick, you have not bound up the injured, you have not brought back the strayed, you have not sought out the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled them. The kings of Israel, the leaders of the people, were supposed to be shepherds that fed their flocks. But instead, most of them misled them, stole from them, and oppressed them, all for selfish gain. The question I want you to consider is this. What or who robs you of your joy? What or who is it that kills your buzz, as we might say? Maybe it's a negative person who just sucks the life out of you. Or maybe it's a negative pattern of thinking. I was just talking to my therapist about how my anxiety was still robbing me of my happy. I've been evaluating my days based on how good or badly I manage my anxiety or my anxiety managed me, when instead I should be evaluating my life on what gives me joy. Rather than evaluating my life on what I have lost, evaluating my life on what I have. So that's my personal thief right now is this anxiety whom I need the safety of the sheepfold and the guidance to green pastures that Jesus provides me with through, as I always say, good grace, good therapist, and good meds. But what's your personal thief? Realize that you've been given a personal security system that is faith in Jesus Christ, who is the giver of life, not the robber of it. The third lesson is life abundant. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
No, this isn't about eternal life. This isn't about us putting our trust in Jesus to someday come and take us all to heaven. Jesus is talking about living an abundant life through him right here and right now. In Les Miserables, Victor Hugo wrote, dying is nothing. What's terrible is not to live. Christ came so that we might live, not just eternally, but presently. It's as John wrote earlier in his prologue, all things came into being through Christ, and without him not one thing came into being. And what has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of the world. I asked the question of our study group on Wednesday night, what would it take for you to live an abundant life? And here were their answers. Joy, kindness, family, quality and meaningful relationships, having done something to encourage or inspire someone. Note they didn't answer a big house, lots of money, and a fancy car. You're going to have to go to another pastor to find a sermon on the prosperity gospel. Instead, it is as someone said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. That's living an abundant life. We have to realize that the abundance of life is not just about prosperity, but it's about the totality of life. There was a parent who had four children, each of whom they sent on a quest to go look at a pear tree. The first went in winter, the second went in spring, the third went in summer, and the fourth went in fall. When they had all finished their quest, the parent called them all back and asked them, what did you think of the tree? Well, the first one who went in winter answered, it was ugly, bent, and twisted. The second one answered, no, when I saw it, it was covered with green bulbs and full of promise. The third one said, the tree I saw was laden with beautiful blossoms that smelled so sweet. The last one said, well, the one I saw was ripe and drooping with fruit. The parents said that all of them were right because they had just seen the tree in a different season. Thus, we shouldn't judge a person by one season because the essence of who a person is can only be measured by all of the seasons. We shouldn't judge our life merely by one season because the essence of who we are is measured by all of the seasons we live. And moreover, if you give up in winter, you'll miss out on all the rest. In shortness, the abundance of life is the fullness of life, both the barren times and the growing times the times to blossom, and the time to bear fruit. All of it in its totality. The final lesson today is that abundant life is especially found in community. As I've told you, that's what I've missed most during this pandemic, is community. But just look at how the first Christian community in the New Testament was described. They were in awe together. They had all things in common. They pooled their resources to help those in need. They worshiped together, shared the sacrament together. They ate together, laughed together, and praised God together. And people noticed. Day after day, people saw that authentic community and said to themselves, I want to be a part of that. You all have genuinely moved me as your pastor, as Rachel expressed her gratitude for 
us being willing to open up our building to future ministers. I have been genuinely moved by getting the mail every day and seeing your generous contributions to the church. In fact, I was so grateful, I was bragging about you all, and you ended up getting an article written about you that should be published by the Presbyterian News Service this weekend. And even though the article is going to focus on the generosity you've shown by your constant and consistent giving to the church, I've heard the stories of the mass you all have been making, the parades you've organized for birthdays, how you've been looking out for one another, even if that means one of you walks on the sidewalk and another of you walks in the street. Little things like that make a big difference when it comes to community. I want us to strive to live out the abundant life of Christ in community in both barren and fruitful times. I want us to strive to live out the abundant life of Christ in community by showing the love that has sustained us even during this time apart. To live out the abundant life of Christ by focusing on what we share in common, not what threatens to divide us. To live out the abundant life of Christ by spending more time giving and less time getting. More time dwelling in scripture rather than on the headlines. More time in prayer than despair. More time with the shepherd, both in the greenest pastures and the darkest valleys. More time with the shepherds and not the thieves of the world. More time living and less time dying. For Jesus came that we might be that we might have life and have it abundantly. And that, my friends, is good news indeed. Amen.
Please join with me in prayer. God, we confidently go to you knowing that you hear us and you love us, knowing that you have our best intentions in mind, even if we don't always understand. We pray that you'll hear us now as we pray together, despite being apart. For those who have mental and physical ailments at this time, we pray that you'll be with those who are recovering from surgery, like Jill Noble. We pray that you'll also be with Bill Barstead and his family at this really hard and uncertain time. Be with their caretakers and their surgeons and doctors. We pray for those who are students who are looking, who have been anticipating this date of graduation for a long time. Give them the sense of joy and hope that all graduates have. For our high school graduates, Elias and Hayden and Stephen. For our undergraduate graduates, Emily, Adam, and Caitlin. For our graduate school and medical school graduates, Molly and Caitlin. And for all those who who are on our hearts that I may have missed. We praise you in the miracle of new life and new birth for Nancy Rapp's family as they welcome a great grandbaby. We pray for those who are entrenched in poverty, who for whom life is constantly a struggle, and yet now, even more so. We pray for our healthcare, <clears throat> excuse me, our healthcare workers and all essential employees at this time, for educators who are working even harder right now, for political leaders and decision makers at this time when it's very uncertain. But we pray also for those who are artists and struggling to find ways to make and create, and those who are unemployed. Give, give us strength and courage and wisdom and discernment. We pray now silently but together for all those who are on our hearts. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the light of Christ surround you, the love of Father God enfold you, the power of Holy Spirit protect you, and the presence of God watch over you. And remember, wherever you are, God is, and all will be well. Grace and peace to you all.